Hello, Chameleon Academy. Welcome to another Chameleon Hour. And I have a special co-host today. This is Armin Kulin of Herp Time. Armin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. All right. Well, uh, Armin, you are you run the HerpTime.com. Uh, for the people who don't know, what is Herp Time and what is it you do? Herp Time is basically my uh, my business and my social media where I breed a lot of um, lesser known, underappreciated species of lizards. And, you know, mm -hmm. I kind of try to promote unknown species of reptiles in general, but I do focus on lizards and mostly I focus on the genus Anolis, which is if you, you could even call that kind of a mini weird type of chameleon. Uh, in its own way, but I, yeah, I, I focus on promoting those and breeding them and making them more popular in the hobby because they're an animal worth having around. So this is where I breed all of my gnolls. Uh, this is kind of the breeding room, hold back room. They used to be all the zoom eds, but I recently switched over to these acrylic, they're called herp cult enclosures. And each enclosure either has a pair or trio of gnolls or some holdbacks. Oh, anoles are, uh, it's an amazing genus. And yes, us chameleon people are well aware of anoles. If anybody who has been around for a while, this is the book that we all grew up uh, with. Uh, this was in the 80s. <laughs> this was uh, all about chameleons and anoles. So uh, we didn't get our own book. We, we always had to be thrown in with anoles. So uh, yeah, we have a long history with anoles, but I am... Yeah. I am excited to uh, learn more about what you are doing and about how uh, the, the wide diversity that is in the Anolis genus. Uh, now, looking at Herp Time, there is a whole lot more that you do. There's social media, there's photography. Uh, how, yeah. how does that fit in? So Herp Time, uh, I mean... I really started the first thing, the first account I had that was called Herp Time. I made it when I was barely in middle school on YouTube was my YouTube name was Herp Time. And it was just okay. me and my friends going out and herping, making videos of us herping and catching stuff and taking photos of it. So um, as I've aged, obviously, I, you know, went through high school, went to college, graduated college, started a business. I, uh, I always... Photography was my side gig in high school and college. And also in college, I started doing social media full time uh, for different reptile related um, influencers. And I still do for uh, some today on the side. And um, yeah, and then I figured, you know what? I have this passion for these lizards. I had always been breeding lizards, but. Uh, I really started kicking it up a notch the past few years, especially once COVID started. And I'm like, you know what? This is what I wish I could be doing. It's a hobby now. Let me try to turn this into the real deal. So I went full out with the lizards and I realized the best way to promote something that is unknown is social media. And that's luckily what I kind of specialize in. And I have uh, taken to my own social media Herp time on Instagram and TikTok and everywhere, promoting the animals I enjoy in hopes that other people also enjoy them. And so far, so good. All right. We are going to dive into uh, his lizard product uh, projects. Uh, but first, uh, Arn Armin is going to be uh, co-hosting and helping me introduce a couple of segments here to uh, start us off. And the first one we have is from Jürgen van Overbeek over in Europe. And he's going to introduce us to the very rare Kaluma Globifer. So let's bring him up and take a look. Hello, everybody. This is Jürgen from Belgium. And I want to introduce you to a few rarely kept species currently kept in Europe. What you see here is actually female of Kaluma Globifer. One of the rarest Kalumas at the moment. But we're working on a nice breeding group. So this is a sub-adult female. Bit difficult to film. I'm gonna try to do my best. It's getting winter now, so they are a little bit more slow 
and next to it you actually see a male. It's currently shedding. These almost reaching maturity, so next summer they can breed. But now they go into a hibernation of around two months. Just want to show you also the enclosures. So like you see, full sprinkling installation, fogger, ventilation, UV, everything. And this is for the female. Thank you all. All right, thank you very much, Jurgen, for sharing that. Now, Arvin, we have the situation in the chameleon community where the European keepers have some species that we don't. And we have some species they don't because of importation and they stop and, well, sometimes we're left with little pockets. Uh, how is it with the anole world? It's honestly very similar, except that we don't have very much here and they have just about everything over there. Oh, really? Uh, in Europe and Germany specifically. Yeah, so I've gotten, um, I would say, majority of my species from uh, Europe. Um, because as you know, the Europeans sometimes have better taste than us over here and they <laughs> have stuff before us. And, uh, for the most part, there's only a couple of, of species of anoles that are sides. Otherwise everything is fair game to bring oh, over really? here easily. And that's what I've done. Yeah. The only sides anoles are a few from Cuba. Uh, like basically anything that is like the, um, the, Nidinoles, yeah, equestrous, okay. and then a few other basically nidinoles that are uh, subspecies and in the same category, and then some Cuban false chameleons as well. But other than that, majority, 99.9% .9 of anoles are not on CITES. So those, are they CITES too? Yeah, they're CITES too. Okay. So if the other ones are not CITES, uh, why would they not be represented here? I guess they need a person like me to kind of okay. give them a voice. Okay, you, just the uh, the demand. It, yeah, the demand. There, I mean, chameleons. There has been a demand for them, kind of since the beginning, and uh, even the more common species, anoles. It's just kind of been the green and the browns, and I've just started to kind of try to push a lot more. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, we actually have a situation like that with chameleons where there's a chameleon the crested chameleon Trasurus cristatus it can be legally exported from cameroon it's one of the only species that can but it's hard to find enough people that want it here to make a shipment worthwhile uh now right interest is building but it's that situation where we'd love to have them but until there's enough of us uh, it just isn't worth it yeah, that makes it hard for sure. And that's where I, I've i uh, found kind of a niche in the anole market where I found all the hard work has been done for me where a lot of the hobbyists in Europe already have them and they're hobbyists. So all they have to do is drop them off at the ham reptile show and then my guy there ships them over here mm, okay. rather than, you know, sourcing, sourcing wild caught stuff is definitely a lot harder i've done it with some species and it's always such a pain i mean as you know you that you have yeah. a lot of experience with the wild caught so whenever i do that it's definitely a bigger way bigger gamble than getting already captive bred stuff from other hobbyists but you know no pain no gain and sometimes it's worth the worth the risk and how big is the anole hobby in europe the Anoha, I mean, it's almost equivalent to like dart frogs. A lot, majority of people there have already kind of intermingled the two. So a lot of people who have dart frogs over there will have anoles in their dart frog vivariums as well. So they've kind of, they're kind of a great uh, co-having partner to dart frogs and other small, small species of lizards and amphibians and so yeah well actually it, it is very good that we can partner with other uh, other breeders around the world that really helps out 
All right, so our next segment is going to be about nematodes insisting in uh, under a chameleon skin. Now, would I be right that, that you would have the same kind of situations with anoles? Definitely. I've definitely seen that with a lot of my wild-caught animals. All right, so many of you out there may be wondering what I mean by insisting and nematodes, worms under the skin, and what is this? And you know what? It's something that we all need to know about. And so I have asked Michael Nash to explain what nematodes insisting is all about. So let's roll this segment. All right, Michael, I wanted to ask a question about insisting. It's a strange behavior of parasites, but uh, we'll see like these these very hard little cysts in the side of a chameleon and it's under the skin and, and it's a nematode that's insisted. I, what in the world is it doing there? Because aren't nematodes supposed to be in the digestive tract? Did it get lost? Does it have a strategy? I, what's going on there? Yeah, sure. So it's a really interesting phenomenon and behavior that you see in a number of different parasites. Um, there's even some coccidial species, some uh, protists, things like that, uh, protozoa that, that do this behavior of insisting. Uh, of course, worms, as you mentioned as well. But Broadly speaking, insisting is uh, it's when essentially whatever parasite you're talking about creates some kind of barrier around itself to sort of go into more or less a dormant state. Mm -hmm. um, now, that dormant state, when triggered appropriately with certain stimuli, it can then sort of become active again, right? In the case of worms that you're talking about, um, often... A parasite, a parasitic worm will go through the intestine and sort of go out into the, the body, as you reference, and then sort of become, quote unquote, dormant. Right. And that's the process of insisting. Now, in some parasites, that is a, they're just waiting there because the wrong signals hit them. And so they don't know what to do. So they just sort of ball up and eventually they might even die in that state. So there's some circumstances where that's almost an accident. Now, in other circumstances, it's by design, more or less, because they're hoping that their host is getting eaten, right? Mm -hmm. So you see that very famously in uh, pork uh, worms, right? So in pork, the life cycle goes where the pork, you know, the pig eats some kind of worm. Then the worm goes on through the tissue, finds muscle, and then insists and sort of just stays in that tissue, right, in that muscle tissue. Then if a human were to eat that muscle tissue with that insisted larva, that worm in it, the worm wants that because then it can then uh, sort of wake up once it hits that digestive system and then it can continue its life cycle, right? So insisting, broadly speaking, is the process by which the parasite sort of develops a protective coating or changes its um, structure so that you can either wait indefinitely and what the per or progress to a different part of its life cycle. So lots of different things influence that overall. Well, would you have any idea, like the nematodes that are subcutaneously in the mm -hmm. chameleon, mm -hmm. do, do they mean to be there? So... I think yes. Many, I mean, there's a number of different species that end up subcutaneously, and it, that's a good place to be in some ways because there's some oxygen, there's some nice ab ability to, you know, suck on blood and get in the tissue where you want to be, but at the same time, you're kind of on the outskirts of the body, so you can avoid some elements of the immune system out there. So it's kind of a nice place if you can find uh, <laughs> your way there. At the same time, then they can reproduce. And then it, if they're at the surface, if a mosquito you know, takes their blood, gets some of their eggs, then you can get the cycle going. So as far as transmission, broadly speaking, being at the surface like that under the skin, it's a pretty good spot to be. 
Now, we have kind of a limited understanding of all the different species that you might find um, it, in a chameleon, of course. So as to whether they're all meant to be there or if it's kind of an accident, that's not really clear. But it certainly could be on purpose and it could be an accident as well. Okay. We have to look at the species level to really be sure about yeah, because I know if the dog hook worm gets into our foot, it gets lost and just <laughs> makes a mess of our, of our foot, but it never finds the bloodstream mm -hmm. and, and uh, completes the cycle. Mm -hmm. So uh, fascinating <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on down there. Yeah. Uh, now here, I'll, I'll throw a surprise question at you. Uh, we hear about coccidia is called, it, it reproduced with, oocysts and we know that coccidia oocysts are just very hard to kill is that related to this insisting at all yes yeah, so the coccidial life cycles are really complex and and a real really kind of a hassle to even <laughs> discuss because in the body i mean they go through all these bizarre stages of like reproduction and division and, and infecting and so on but to answer your question, yeah, um, part of the reason why they're hard to get rid of is because they're in this kind of more or less dormant state. And in that state, it's a trade-off because they're not really doing anything, right? They're just a blob. Right. Uh, but the benefit is that they're all <laughs> indestructible, right? Yeah. They're, they're, you can't get rid of them easily. So. It, there's probably some way to exploit that. Like for instance, there's a duck coccidia or a, a fat like bird coccidia that the oasis, they come out and they stay totally dormant unless they are present in sort of damp leaf litter and then they become active. And then now it, it's, you know, in, in this kind of insisted form, but now all of a sudden it's active. And then that okay. key transition point is where it's pathogenic. Um, so yeah, it's all about what it feels like doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. All right, Michael. I want to thank you very much for that explanation. Uh, there's a lot of mysteries there to just tease out. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's a very, parasites are such strange creatures. I'd like to, I guess if you don't mind, I'd like to share one kind of interesting oh, thing please about do. the cord parasite. Uh, that it this might be is Trichinella we're talking about? Yes, exactly. Right. Um, so, you know, we kind of describe it as, oh, it has this life cycle where, oh, it's specific to the pig. You know, it, it insists in the tissue. The human eats it. And then they, uh, they produce more parasites is the idea, right? But in that process, the human doesn't usually get hurt that much. It's They get some nutrients taken and they, you know, excrete more eggs effectively and it, it keeps the cycle going. But importantly, if a human consumes a living worm that is not insisted, right, of trichinella, that can get you in really bad shape. And it, it, it what happens is if you eat that worm and you get that from like feces from a pig or something, then the worm just treats you as if you're its real host. Uh. Okay. And then it migrates wherever it wants, and then it insists in your body instead. And unfortunately, because it's not really supposed to do that in a human, if it does that, it can cause this really severe clinical mm -hmm. manifestation where it makes a cyst in your brain. Oh. Uh, and that can be really, really deadly. And, Doesn't and sound very good. Deadly. So, so we're... So we are playing the role of both the intermediary host and the dead end host, depending upon what form we take in. Exactly. And that's what's super interesting because, I mean, whether it's insisted or crawling around, it has completely different implications for what happens if you consume it. And, uh, you know, it's it, you wouldn't think that's that big a deal, but it just really yeah. highlights that that because piece of the life cycle. It yeah. becomes a when it's insisted, it gets into our digestive tract and it becomes the worm. And so apparently there's a huge difference as to whether you take the worm in or if it becomes a worm inside of you. Yeah, it, it's 
it's crazy you'd think that there's any difference because that worm does exist in your gut. <laughs> but if it hits your upper GI system as a worm, then there's a different trigger, right? And then, oh, it goes out and causes all this damage. So it, yeah, it's just one example because, you know, we, we talk about these life cycles as kind of determined, but in reality, you know, it's hard to know exactly what stage of the parasite you're ingesting. There, there's all these weird things that can happen like that. And I'm sure the same applies for chameleons or really anything else. And perhaps this is, uh, it, this helps us to appreciate how big the world is to these parasites to the point where the upper GI tract and the lower GI tract are just two totally different worlds to a parasite that is this small and it's getting different cues from the different chemicals uh, and the, the cues that are in the different areas within our body uh, mm -hmm. telling it to do different things. Oh. Right. And in theory, you know, you're right that we'd be kind of a dead end host. But if you think about it, if something came and ate us, if we had a bunch <laughs> of cysts, then we would no longer be a dead end host, right? It just doesn't really make sense because nothing really eats as much. But. Well, just like Toxoplasma. <laughs> Toxoplasma, well, yeah. God, do you? Yeah, we're, we're a dead end host unless a cat eats us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, our our poor ancestors <laughs> had to worry about that. <laughs> All right, well, I want to I thank you so much for uh, for sharing with us a little uh, unappetizing parasitic <laughs> education. Yeah, happy to talk about it. it's it's interesting, pretty disturbing, but fun to talk about. So, uh, did anybody here need a reminder as to why we cook our meat? There you go. I apologize for any nightmares I may have caused by that segment. We in the chameleon world, we uh, really concentrate on parasites and we research them. We have to deal a lot with parasites, but we're a little bit, uh, dare I say, a little bit lucky because our chameleons stay up in the branches. The poop goes all the way down to the cage. So we have a little bit more leeway than other other reptile people where say the reptiles run through their poop after they poop uh how is the parasite situation with anoles what do you have to deal with i would say i mean i've treated chameleon i've had chameleons and treated them as well and i would say it's almost mirror image because okay. anoles unless they have to grab a uh an insect on the ground or they have to lay eggs there's no reason for them to really be on the ground for majority of the species they're all going to okay. be on trunks in branches so um it's it's similar where it's easier to isolate the issue and stop kind of the once you know what's going on it's easy to keep it under, under control because again they're not wallowing in their own poop or they're not a snake a terrestrial snake that just kind of sitting in their own mm -hmm. waste um so or like a tortoise for example you know it's kind of just continually in that situation whereas the anoles are kind of doing their thing and then where they hang out is clean similar to chameleons you know okay so it's uh i i would say it's pretty mirror image well let's go ahead and dive into what does a typical anole cage look like in there under the context of explaining what is a typical day in the life of an anole? Well, the main thing they need is vertical space. They're arboreal for the most part. Uh, they're very rarely going to be on the ground only to basically lay eggs. So they need a lot of vertical and that's kind of what I've provided depending on the species like twig anoles need smaller branches the uh, different trunk type species require larger branches uh, that are uh, aimed downwards because that's what they would naturally be on. And other than that, that's about it. You can, of course, add foliage if you like, but they're really not going to be hiding in the foliage. Uh, if you imagine an anole in the wild, a brown anole in Florida, they're never really hiding inside the, the plants. They're kind of more out in the open because if they're comfortable, that's where they're going to be. That's how these are set up. And they've got a lay box in there. And sphagnum moss um, will hold the humidity well over the day and through the night. And we got simple breeding setups in here. 
And how do they get their water? Um, normally, I would have the misting system go off three to four times a day, um, shorter periods than the two times I hand mist. Uh, but they drink from water droplets similar to a chameleon. They're kind of in the trees, looking for food, waiting around, just hanging out, defending their territory if they're a male. If they're a female, they're kind of in the harem of the the dominant male in that area. So, day in the life of a Noah is kind of laid back, relaxed, looking for food and making sure that the opponent doesn't take your girls. <laughs> it sounds like a good life for me. <laughs> All yeah. right. So... You're the perfect person to ask this next question because you have had chameleons before. Uh, right. Most of my audience uh, is chameleon people, uh, but I know sure. a number of us have looked at anoles. We've seen the uh, the equistress, the blue beauty anole. We've seen yeah. the night anoles. We have seen some incredible anoles out there, and I know a number of us would be sorely tempted to uh, get an anole or two in our, our own collection. What kind of things would somebody who is well-versed with chameleons, what are the things that we would have to change if we brought an anole into our collection? Um, I think the only thing you would have to change is having to be so worried about your lizards because anoles <laughs> compared to chameleons are so much more hardy they're just in general they're so much easier you can go on vacation for a week and literally as long as you have someone there to give them some water or you have an automatic missing system they're completely fine it's almost like the snake version of a lizard i would say besides the babies of course all babies are fragile but the adults in general are so robust that um they're really if you can if you have successfully kept chameleons you can keep as many anoles as I have in this room, no problem. <laughs> I can't tell you. I'm just you telling you. How many people have said something like that when I've asked them that question? Like, you chameleon people are crazy. <laughs> well, I mean, I keep chameleons and I have no problem keeping chameleons. I'm just saying for the average, you know, the okay. person walking into a pet smart is going to have a much harder time if their first lizard is a chameleon versus a leopard gecko or a green anole. Now, even first... even when your first lizard is a green and old people mess up. So you know how <laughs> oh, chameleons yeah. go when it's a new, new, you know, herper. But no, if you're an avid watcher of Chameleon Academy and you know what you're doing, then I say take a jab at it. You have literally nothing to lose with the gnolls. <laughs> do you have to worry about them running out the door if you open the door? That's true. That is the okay. one thing you probably will have because chameleons aren't going to jump out on you. The anoles are pretty quick. They're for sure. They're like lightning. And once they're out, oh man, you better have a plan of attack. Otherwise, <laughs> I mean, in the ideal situation, if you have a bunch of lizards and you lose a cricket or two, don't worry about the anoles. They'll go and find them. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll be good for a month or two out of the cage, but yeah, you better have a plan of how you're going to get that little sucker back. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, let, let's say we're interested uh, in anoles. What are some of the common species? What is there a beginner anole uh, and advanced anoles, ones that are harder than others, I imagine? Yeah, for sure. So, of course, the issue is price, because when you think of beginner lizard, usually you're also thinking the price is going to be a little less. So when you go to get a cheap anole, you're, of course, usually getting a wild-caught one. And those are going to tend to be the green anoles, the brown anoles, and the Cuban night anoles. And those are usually all wild-caught in the south, mainly Florida. But like we talked about earlier in this episode, parasites become an issue. Mm -hmm. And um, when an animal is stressed, the parasites uh, have a better chance to attack because the immune system is down. And that's when you come to issues uh so a great beginner anole would be any of those green brown or cuban knight um if they're captive bred if not you can still get a great one wild caught but it's much harder if you never treated for parasites or you don't know the signs you can get one that it has some and if you don't do anything in time you can lose the lizard very easily because of course they're small um but 
one species that has really come to popularity in recent years that is in the Anolis genus is the Cuban false chameleon. So that's Anolis barbatus. It's also called the bearded anole. They're, they can, I mean, just like a, that's why they get their name false chameleon. They vary so much in, they can change their color so quickly and drastically. They can go from like almost a dark blackish brown to a bright white to greenish. And they also can move their eyes independently. Um, hmm. And similar to a chameleon, they're very slow. They, they're they actually great for handling. They don't stress easily with handling. And depending on your lizard, they actually have a lot of personality. Some, like I said, are great for handling. Some have a little bit of attitude. But once they're out, they're friendly. And if you can, those are probably the best beginner in all. The Anolis barbatus, the Cuban false chameleon, bearded in all. Because, like I said, they have great personalities. They're slow, so they're easy to handle. They're not going to jump out of the cage on you. They are quick to tongue feed. They're quick to recognize you. They stay a decent size, and since they don't move a lot, you can keep them something in like an 18, 18, 24, um, and one or a pair would be more than happy in that, I think. And for a chameleon person, that is the great gateway in all, I think. Okay. It doesn't have the most color yeah. like you're used to with chameleons, but... Uh, personality and care wise it's a great one all right now of course we chameleon people are used to one chameleon per cage is it the same with right. anoles uh not really some people might do that but that's definitely not the way majority of the people in europe and the few that are over here breeding them seriously like you might know who ron saint pierre is he's the kind of um he wasn't the first to do it, but he's pioneered and like brought it to light the giant blue booty anoles mm -hmm. and uh, other giant anoles from Cuba. But none of us who are breeding anoles um, on larger scale keep them separately. Usually you can keep a pair together, a trio together. You can even keep a male with multi like more than three females because in the wild, anoles kind of depends on where the species lives in the, you know, ecomorph. But you imagine you go to Florida, you see a tree trunk. Usually it's one male on one side of the tree trunk, his group of ladies, and then all their babies at the bottom. Hmm. So it's kind of built in a way where they have the males have kind of a group around them. And uh, the females generally don't bully each other. And the males don't bully the females. All they want to do is Very make nice. sure they're safe and breed them. So, yeah, you can definitely – I would definitely advise to keep uh, multiple – because it's much more fun to watch them interact that way. Now, you mentioned something about uh, the false chameleon uh, being easier to handle. Are, uh, right. How are anoles, and I know when we're talking about 400 species, wide range, but right. what is the handleability of, say, select anole species that we might run into? So... Like I said, the Cuban false chameleon is definitely the best for handling. It's slow moving and it is uh, friendlier in general. So it's going to want to hang out with you. When you raise, just like any animal, when you raise a lizard from a baby, you can basically get any anole to become like a bearded dragon. Okay. But it's much easier when you're working with a large night anole versus a tiny green anole as a baby. So in general, it's easier. If you want a handling lizard, I would go for the larger anoles. I have uh, night anoles and um, similar species from Cuba that are also crown giant anoles. That's what the large species are called that live high in the trees. Those include mm -hmm. night anoles and other like anola smallwoodi, um, anolis uh, baracoa. Those are all night like crown giant anoles. They are easier to... Uh, for handling because they start out larger and it's easier to deal with that. Uh, similarly, I have other species like the Cuban stream and all they start out larger and it's easier to get them going on handling and so socialization as well. So any anole is handleable and trainable, but it, like I said, easier when they're big. And which are the, shall we say the, the, the more desirable or sought after, maybe that's the right word, sought after species. Like, I mean, I've seen the blue beauty and all that is an amazing species. Right. Uh, so what is, what are some species that are in that category? 
So the most sought after annuls are basically variations of the annuls everyone knows, but like maybe a morph version or a version okay. that they never seen before. For example, the blue beauty is a subspecies of the regular night annul. Okay. So the blue beauty comes from a tiny island off of Cuba. The night annul is, you know, the general species. So you know what a night annul looks like, and then you see the blue beauty and you're like, whoa, that's nuts. Yeah. Another annul I found that people really like is the I I have line bred um brown annuls that are bright like fire engine red. So people know what a brown annul is supposed to look like and then yep. they see the fire red ones and they're like, Whoa, I need to have that. Another species is called Anolus Allisoni. It looks like a green annul. The only difference is the front half of the body is completely like blue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's another species where it's supposed to look like a green and all. It has the same body structure and color on one end, but then the whole front end is bright blue. So I think those are the most desirable species to the people who don't necessarily know all the species because mm -hmm. it's something that you're familiar with and it doesn't look how it should. So that makes people yeah. excited because it's something they think looks rare. Now how easy is it to find these species of anoles? Um, it takes a little bit of work. It's not like you can just Google it and the first thing is going to pop up ad or something. A lot of the time they're not on morph market. The best way to find these is honestly, you can message me or you find similar people on Facebook groups or you look up Instagram hashtags of other people. Anoles are honestly very easy to breed. They readily breed. Um, so chances are, if you find someone on Instagram with a pair of the species you like, more than likely they will have babies at some point or another. Okay. And sometimes you get up overrun with babies and people will just send it. Like people send me when I set, sell them a pair, they just start sending me their babies because they don't know what to do with them. So they don't ever feel bad asking anyone when they have annuls, if they have babies, because I'm sure they will be more than happy to share them with you. Well, uh, please share how easy is it to breed them or more importantly how what does it take to incubate the eggs and raise yeah. them babies i incubate the eggs in this room this room stays around 80 to 84 degrees depending on time of the day when the lights warm it up uh these are the eggs and i house them individually because they annuls lay an egg at a time so i don't want them to flip the other over if they hatch for example this one just hatched and if it was with another, it might toss the its neighbor over. So I don't want that. And this is a Anolis roquette selenite, which is a pretty cool species. I'm the only one with in the U.S. right now. Anoles generally hatch out pretty ugly. So <laughs> this thing hatched out brown. But as an adult, it'll be a bright, like, lime green with black saddles. Very cool species. And this is a female. You can tell because she has the stripe down her back. Wonderful. How many different species do you have represented here in the eggs? In the eggs? I have uh, probably 30 to 35 species in the eggs. I have around 40 species of anoles. Not all. I've been successful majority. Um, some, I have different seasons, but majority will continue to produce almost a year round. I try to slow them down this time of the year to give the females a break. Otherwise, it can be kind of stressful on them. But yeah, definitely at least 30 species here. And the anole eggs, like I was saying, are extremely hardy. As long as they have relatively the correct temperatures and humidity, they can hatch. Like I said, the the range of temperature to hatch is so vast. They can hatch in less than 30 days or in over 60 days hmm. and also hmm. depends on the species. But they they hatch out like that and then it's that's kind of the difficult part because they're smaller than a chameleon when they hatch out and they're just as delicate sometimes when they first hatch the first month or two. So anyone who's bred chameleons knows Fruit flies are your friend. One week old crickets are your friend. And that's kind of what you have to go with until they're past that scary, tiny stage. So how do you feed them? Uh, like we use uh, feeder cups. 
uh, to contain. Right. Is it the same for the anoles? I don't use feeder cups. Uh, I literally just let the insects go in their enclosure. And will they, and they root around and find the insects that are hiding? And, yeah, they, they're okay. quick. They, they're they quick and they just grab them. But they they would definitely use feeder feeder cups if I use them, for sure, no doubt. Like oh. when I feed mealworms, I put them in a cup and they go right up to it and they'll grab them out of there. Uh, we've been doing a whole lot more in the community with bioactive and uh, it just sounds like the anoles would be perfect for uh, a bioactive situation. Yeah probably clean out all the isopods uh how big yeah. of a cage would say a pair of the larger the night anoles need so the largest species are the you know the equestrous and the subspecies the blue beauty um generally people were keeping them in 1818 36s okay. but it's kind of changed to where people prefer them prefer to keep them in 36 1836s so the largest you know paludarium style mm -hmm. enclosures from zoomed and exoterra um also like a two by two by four would uh or whatever the, a large yeah, okay. uh, standard panther chameleon cage would work well um that's ideal for a larger pair of anoles I would okay. say, considering, you know, they are almost two feet long lizards. I mean, of course, it's more than half tail, but they're still large and they're still, still very arboreal and active. Okay. And how is uh, the community, the anole community, how established is it? How big is it? Is it growing? What's the situation? The anole community is still small, at least in the United States. In Europe, it's actually a lot larger than you would expect. And it's a lot more old timers. Uh, I hit, don't know why I keep using that word, but it's more seasoned people, I should say, that have been doing it for <laughs> quite a long time. Uh, the anole community here, there were there actually are a lot of people who have been who had been doing it for a long time, and this was before social media, you know, eighties, nineties, and they had very rough. They had great success with the animals, but they had very bad luck with selling the babies so mm -hmm. they kind of got out of it but when i go to reptile shows and there's guys who have been doing it forever they're like oh my gosh i'm the one who brought those originally i'm like wow i had no idea they're like yeah i couldn't sell them for the life of me and I'm like well i just sold 20 of them this month or something <laughs> so times have definitely changed and i've kind of i don't want to take credit for it but a lot of like me ron st pierre a lot of other people who are promoting anoles on social media have really kind of revamped the community otherwise it was pretty much a dying community so it's uh kind of cool to be have at least a little part in that and so are you still actively breeding and selling the anole species oh yeah for sure that's okay. my main goal is to produce because i have a lot of species i've never that have never been sold in the united states before so okay. Uh, majority of them, honestly. So I've been kind of breeding some of the wild caught animals, um, holding back offspring so I can have my captive bred um, pairs. And then I can, from there, sell an F2 generation to other people who okay. want to enjoy them as well. How are we doing as a community as far as bloodline diversity? Uh, it could definitely be better because, like I said, I'm a lot of these species I'm the only one with and I kind of have to if there's only three pairs in Europe I'm getting all three pairs if I can regardless it's still not a ton of yeah uh genes to go around but like I said anoles are similar to for example a uh kind of a day gecko like the electric blue day gecko you imagine they never leave the one tree they're born on and they kind of continue that way it's very similar with anoles where they they're laid at the their egg is laid at the base of the tree. They grow up on that tree with the adults. And then mm. if they're a female, they'll kind of stay there. If they're a male, they'll kind of move on to the tree over. It's a, if it's empty and they'll start their own little colony right there. So they, they don't move a lot. And even though they're very active, they don't travel far distances. So bloodline isn't a huge issue, but of course you okay. don't want to breed siblings with siblings for generation on generation. So it's something I definitely uh, work on, but um, for now we're okay considering it's all so fresh. 
Okay. What are your plans are your goals uh, for the next year going forward? What kind of projects are you working on? Uh, projects I'm working on are, like I said, getting a lot of these species to um, other hobbyists that want to okay. work with them. Also, so that, you know, if anything ever happened to me or my collection, some, God forbid, some crazy disease ran through it. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be in other people's hands as well so yeah. that they'd never, you know, be lost forever. They'd still be in this country. Um, similarly, I am uh, I'm working on building out some stuff in other parts of this place where i have very large enclosures where i hope to have like you know a hundred of one species a hundred of another species in one mm. large enclosure just to kind of showcase what i've been talking about how they they're really a communal um genus where they can interact with each other with each other and they understand each other and they have a kind of a hierarchy and a lot of people think oh males you can never house a male with a male well if you have the right amount of space and the right amount of ratio, then the males create their own hierarchy and won't kill each other. And they understand where they belong in the certain system. So okay, that's what I'm working. Some very large enclosures that are going to kind of display just how amazing they are. Just like how you would imagine a giant um, tropical fish tank, a community mm -hmm. tank. I want to do that with the anoles to showcase how beautiful they are. So if you had to choose... I would say three species that you think would be the the best for establishing. So if somebody says, I want to be part of this, what would be, and, you know, we do this with chameleons. Uh, there's some of these yeah. very far out there rare species. And if somebody gets three pairs of those, it's like, well, that's fun, but it's not going anywhere because there isn't enough uh, critical mass for it to be successful. Uh, it, are right. there, say, maybe three species that would be great for establishing within the community in the U.S.? There are quite a few. The one I am working on establishing, me and only one other guy are breeding them in the United States, but I started with four pairs and based on holding back, you know, 40 babies and crossing bloodlines and stuff, I'm up to quite a few pairs now. Um, is It's called Anolis valencini. It's the Jamaican twig and all. So it's basically the Cuban false chameleon, half the size and um, almost same demeanor, kind of a cooler look, has more coloration. And it's a very cool species because, like I said, it's handleable like the Cuban false chameleon. Smaller package, so you can easily keep a pair in something like a 12, 12, 18. And um, they're just a cool one that I think is worth having around because – they're handleable, which is always mm -hmm. a plus for a lot of people. It gets people into the hobby when they can know they can hold a lizard. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, Anole and Chameleon people are similar where they, they accept the fact they can't always hold their pets, which I'm okay with because it's so beautiful. It's, I, I appreciate just being able to see them. But yeah. getting people into the hobby, they usually want to hold something. So Jamaican Twig Anole. Uh, another one that I think is really cool is Anolus Grammi. It's the Jamaican Turquoise Anole. They're about... A little bit bulkier than a brown and all, kind of same build, but they're a bright turquoise body that goes into a bright purple tail. They breed easily. They're not that shy. Again, like most anole species, they're not handleable. They're very quick, but they're just such a beautiful animal that they like. They rival an electric blue day gecko, mm -hmm. or they rival, you know, a bright nosy bay panther chameleon. Okay. They're just that beautiful to me. So I think they're a beautiful display animal that, if other people had them, which I've gotten them into some good people's hands that are producing them now, it seems like we're going to be able to have those as a staple, which I hope is possible. And uh, one more species. Hmm. Let's think. I'm looking around my room to see if I can name one. Well, somebody out there is going to say, "What about the blue beauty and all?" Where does that stand in this? Well, I, I would say that's already been established. Oh, okay. And um, be, literally, no, I don't think there's one anole that's kept more than that besides green and brown anoles by, you know, random people. Yeah. But as an intentional, like, I want to keep anoles, that's the one that, like, everyone has. And okay. it's funny because people start out with that. That's the most expensive anole you can find, right? And how much is that? Well, they were about... About two years ago, they were five thousand. Last year, they were twenty five hundred. Now they're at like fifteen hundred. So 
if you really want to get one, hold okay. off another year, and I'm, they'll probably be under a thousand bucks. So <laughs> okay, uh, so that just kind of shows you how so many people have got them. They're kind of being overproduced for the demand. Uh, but regardless, that the funny thing is, people get those because they're so beautiful, and they fall in love with the knolls, and they don't know what else to get because there's nothing else to get. So then they usually come to me because I'm the only one with other like bright, cool species. Um, so yeah. those, those are, I would have said a few years ago, those needed to be established, but the work's been done and those things are not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, mission so, accomplished. Yeah. Mission accomplished on those. So an, I think another large species that's very similar that is basically established, but not as many people have is Anolis ludigularis, which is very similar to the blue beauty, but it's called the Cuban giant white white lip anole and they're kind of a minty green color with a really bright white lip and they're just beautiful and they're really they're a lot tamer than the blue beauties and they make for a great display and pet so i think those three are my go-to's you have given i i, I know a number of people are going to be sorely tempted and maybe <laughs> contacting you uh and I have certain names in my mind because I know how these people think. I, yeah. I know my people. <laughs> and uh, if they are interested in getting involved with anoles, uh, what steps should they take? Well, the steps they should take are you can, I think the best places to learn are, unfortunately, I need to be better about posting information on YouTube. You're amazing at this, Bill, because you've you created so many guides and helpful things for resources for people to find stuff about chameleons i wish i was uh more disciplined in doing that for anoles because there's not very much good information about anoles online but the lucky thing is anole care is all generally the same because most of the anoles we have in the u.s all come from the caribbean and all the caribbean islands have very similar temperature humidity so all the care requirements are very similar to what you would find of a brown anole so if you really can't find information on the anole you're looking for, uh, but you can find the anole, the care requirements are most likely going to be very similar to a brown anole, which is a lot of care information about. And then to take it a step further, if you're looking for that cool species, uh, you can always message me on Instagram, Facebook, uh, or you can... Another great place to go is Facebook groups. I know there's some hate towards Facebook groups. Sometimes they can mm -hmm. be toxic. But Ugh. honestly, the Anole Facebook, there's two Anole Facebook groups. The main one I would suggest joining on Facebook is Anolis uh, Breeders and Enthusiasts um, on Facebook. And that's a great one. Everyone's pretty helpful. If you ask a question in there, uh, anyone who really breeds Anoles in the U.S. is part of that group. So... Chances are, if it's in the U.S., even a lot of people in Europe, that's how I've connected with a lot of people in Europe and found species and been able to import them because I asked and people connected me through there. So that's a great group if you are looking for something that is on the more obscure side. Uh, other than that, okay, they're very easy to care for. And like I said, brown and all, just tweak it a little depending on the, the island they come from. Well, can you give us a general idea of what kind of temperatures and humidities yeah uh, for sure would be looking for and so, by the way when we're saying this all people look for the actual species that yeah. you're getting this is just to give you a magnitude of what you're looking exactly at. so the general thing i go by is you want an they all need uv that's a given uvb mm -hmm. depending on the species they can all handle you uh 10.0 uh, but for the smaller species, I tend to give them 5.0 because they are not going to be super high in the trees. The larger species do prefer 10.0, like the night knolls, the blue beauties. Um, but regardless, 10.0, 5.0, and then ambient temperatures are around 80. And then you want to back. Is that T5? Yeah. T5. I prefer T. I always use T5. Okay. I don't, I haven't used a T8 in forever. I can't remember. Last time I did, but T5, I definitely recommend. And, and how far above the cage are those bulbs? I keep, we have UVB nerds here. Yeah, definitely. I keep them right above the cage because okay. they they will definitely regulate themselves. And uh, 
as long as you give them a spot to get some shade or get away, they'll they'll go use it if they need. But they do like intense UV. So if you've ever been to Florida okay. and you look, the anoles are literally sitting on the sidewalk trying to soak up as much as they can. Um, anyway, right. the ambient, I would say around like 80. Low end is 80. Okay. And ambient, uh, you know, similarly. And then I keep... I have T5 UVs in these uh, grow fixtures that I got from Amazon and they create a lot of heat, whether that's good or bad. It's enough to create about a hundred degree hotspot, which is what is ideal for them. Mm -hmm. So you want that range from lower and lower bottom of the cage, so 78 to 80. And then once you hit the top, you have a nice basking spot a few inches from the top that can hit around a hundred degrees. So misting is definitely essential. Like I said earlier in the talk, uh, they really only drink from water droplets or moving water. So misting at least once a day, I would definitely recommend a misting system. If you have chameleons, you probably got all that stuff going. So you're set up, but, um, humidity generally is going to be around 60 to 80%. Um, which I maintain that in my enclosures with sphagnum moss because it holds the water well and throughout the day it keeps it humid with that warm light um so yeah 60 80 percent it doesn't have to be exact they can go 50 they can go 90 but i say 60 to 80 is ideal all right sounds good i think that's our and i assume just feeding um they'll just take anything that moves and fits in their mouth well that's the cool thing actually a lot of the species will also not only do they eat insects yes uh, they eat fruit and flowers and stuff like that. The majority of the species are actually omnivorous, really? which is really cool. Even the giant blue beauties, okay. they will eat bananas out of your hand. They love crescent gecko oh, that's diet. Cool. Yeah, so they're very uh, wow. variable in that way. But there's no problem if you fed them 95% insects, they wouldn't mind either. And uh, what kind of supplementation do you give these guys? Uh, basically anything you'd give to your chameleon or other arboreal lizard that really likes UV. So definitely calcium. And, um, I don't use calcium with D3 all the time, but I will use it every like three or four times that I use calcium. Um, and then just general other vitamins and you want to make sure you're gut loading your insects because like, not only are they, they eat insects, but like I said, they, are omnivorous so they'll eat other things besides insects so it just shows you how important what's inside the insect is as well because mm-hmm. um they're they would be eating what the insects eating if the insects also eating you know plant material or uh fruits yeah. and stuff so definitely gut loading is one of the most important things besides dusting and my last question on these guys is what's the general lifespan uh, it definitely depends on the species. Smaller species aren't going to live as long. But even then, the smaller species can live 10 years or more. And the larger species can live okay. well over 15, 20. So they they can right. be long-lived for sure. Uh, best place to get a hold of you. You mentioned a number of different social medias. Uh, where, where are you most active? I think Instagram is definitely the best place to reach me. Okay. Uh, Facebook, okay. I don't go on as much. Um, so Instagram, I'm usually on every day and unless you send me a really weird message, uh, I will always respond. So <laughs> yeah, Instagram, even if it takes me a day or two, you know, I get a lot of messages had those before. <laughs> have a life and animals to take care of, but I will usually always get back to you if you message me on Instagram. All right, Armin, this has been a wonderful time. Thank you for co-hosting this show with me. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to have been on it and love Love always watching your stuff, so it's so cool to finally be here. Well, anything else you want to tell the chameleon community before Uh, we sign off? I think if you have kids and you keep chameleons, but you don't want them to keep chameleons yet, get an anole, even a green or a brown anole. It's the great (laughs) starter chameleon. It's better than any starter chameleon because it'll teach them the basics, but it's much harder to kill them. Okay, (laughs) there you go, the words of wisdom. All right, then, Armin and everybody else in Chameleon World, we will see you later. Bye.